Hi guys, I am Deepa. Welcome to a Shakti Expert Panel. Uh, we are doing this for the first time and the topic that we are addressing is, um, is something that is impacting all of us right now with the, um, uh, with the protests and riots and everything that is going on within the country on top of um, the pandemic situation that we were already going through. So with me, I have uh, Trent Clark and Ahmed Abbas. Um, so I'm Deepa, I'm the founder and CEO of Journeys from Zinda, a platform that is all about bringing people together and acting as one. Uh, Trent and Ahmed, can you guys introduce yourself? Trent, you first and then Ahmed. Great, I'm Trent Clark. I own Leadershipity, involved with three different companies with Leadershipity and Transitions and Leadersport. And um, most people know me because I spent 13 years in pro baseball as a coach and through a few World Series. Awesome. Ahmed? Yes, uh, my name is Ahmed Awais. I'm an Agile coach. I'm the founder and president of Agile 7. I am a practicing Agile coach for, for quite some long time, and I'm currently working in the fintech space. I tend to be known for you know, doing liberating structures and doing more positive and inclusive conversations about a larger group of people. So that's where I am, and I'm currently based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Awesome, awesome. So we are in uh, three different places, uh, Chicago, Michigan, and uh, North Carolina, Illinois, Michigan, and North Carolina. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I think you know, we form a, uh, a slice of the representation of what an American workforce looks like you know, with respect to uh, diversity, right? Uh, so, um, and th this is unprecedented, right? In my lifetime, for sure. Uh, and uh, because, you know, as it is, we were struggling with pandemic and the impacts of that with, uh, you know, with um, basically changing the way, our way of life, uh, getting so many, having so many jobs impacted, our entire way of life impacted. And now on top of that, we have uh, these events that have happened in the last uh, couple of weeks that was really, uh, that really shone light on, you know, things that need to improve in uh, America as a society. So uh, I know, I don't know about you, but I've been having, I typically try not to talk on Facebook about sensitive topics because, you know, I, I try not to, but I've actually been engaging in conversations because that is, I mean, everybody's talking about this. It is a burning topic. It, it is fueling a lot of passionate conversations everywhere. You know, that is, I'm talking about this with my friends and my alum groups and uh, neighbors, everybody, right? Uh, are you guys facing the same? Are you guys seeing the same kind of things in your lives as well? Is this, is this topic kind of taken over everything else that is happening like it's been happening for me? Or how is it for you? Go ahead, Amit. So, uh, absolutely. I think uh, the pandemic was perhaps, you know, it's, 2020 has been a strange year. So, and uh, with, with the pandemic just about to stabilize, we have this event, which is not necessarily, I mean, I, 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 mean, I want to honor and recognize it, but what is happening, what happened to George Floyd, yep. what happened to Ahmad Arbery, and these series of events is all impacting us, our livelihoods, our workplaces. And this is our opportunity to use our privileges to shift the conversation so that this is probably the last of these events. It's impacting, I mean, I have my colleagues who are black, who are afraid, who are generally afraid and scared to work and go out because they don't know what, it's, it's like a powder keg that's ready to explode. So, and we hear about violence and we also hear about people who are trying to stop violence and stop these rioters. And, you know, we see, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened by something in Flint, Michigan. I mean, the sheriff joined yeah. with the protest. Yeah. In Fayetteville, North Carolina, the police chief was joining the protesters. And, you know, not to, to amplify bad behavior, but seeing that how can we shift this conversation? Yeah. How can we make it better for everybody at work, at home? I'm having difficult conversations with my very young kids. But, you know, in this household, we say that Black lives matter. And, you know, anti-racism is a thing that we need to, we need to focus on. So in those conversations are happening at work, at home, we're all in Paris. It's filling up all the space. And yes, right. I wonder about all these large crowds and what will happen next in two weeks with the right. still in the background. Yeah, that is true. Trends. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, what's interesting about this whole process is that 
it's 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 gigantic news and there are so many good stories and i was reading this morning of munich in the same breath right like the entire police force at the march took their helmets off and marched together with the protesters mm-hmm. so i was just so impressed with that so there's an international so one of the things that is impactful of the recent news and and, and maybe it all started Maybe it was a lead up to the pandemic, right? Because the, the pandemic theme was, hey, we're all in this together. And that, and that was true, right? This is no one's immune to the pandemic, right? It's, it's, if you are at risk, it doesn't care, old, young. Well, it does probably care a little bit more old because it's, it is certainly targeting an at-risk population, right? But we're recognizing that, hey, color doesn't matter. Any of these things, the pandemic is going to attack. So the all together kind of mantra was in this most recent development of items has now really impacted, we all are in this together and it has impacted everyone. And, and I think Ahmed just made a great point, like right down to our children who don't watch the news, who don't know what's going on, but those conversations now are having under our roofs and those are good things. I mean, there, there's a lot of good things that come from bad things. And as, as Ahmed and I both know as coaches, most of our learning's done when things are going bad, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this is a mess. We got to fix it. And, and as, that, as that awareness just becomes more and more, and I'm impressed with um, that progress has been made in our own country. I'm impressed that progress has been made, but clearly we're not there. And, and, and there's a journey here along this. And this is another step that just, I think is going to ultimately get us to another level on that journey that's going to improve things. But boy, I mean, you know, I guess we all say like, you know, I don't want the hard things, but I want to get better. Well, if you do the hard things, you really get better. Okay. <laughs> so, so I think like as a country and as, and as a world right now, I think we're doing the hard things and, and it's painful, right? Like it's, it's the pain of discipline and it's, it's not easy. Yeah. And I think pandemic actually, you know, pandemic probably is what caused it the fact that everybody was at home and everybody's attention was on media is probably what brought this up again right because the thing is that you know um, there have been incidents that have happened in the past but right now everybody's attention was on it and it just struck a chord with so many people right it just struck a chord with so many people seeing the images uh, so, uh, you know, probably there is some kind of a, some kind of a, you know, relationship with the fact that we were all sit at home well, as well. So, yeah, I, and I wonder, I wanted to yes and that because sometimes there's a proverb saying like that's the straw that broke the camel's back, mm-hmm. right? It was not the straw that broke it, but there's a series of systemic and systematic, you know, re- organizational racism that came to this point. And did it trigger, could be, could be, but I think people were already on edge for many reasons. Yeah. Right. And, and, and honestly, uh, we do not want to be America for, for, for the model of freedom. We don't want to look like a police state. Mm. Right? And we have good police officers. We have good people, good, honest people. And, you know, how do we separate, you know, how do we separate the noise? So it could be amplified because we live in now rapid news cycles and fake news. And, and I, I, I hate that term, by the way. But you know, yeah, you know, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words, and that's the hard thing about hard things, right? What uh, what Trent was saying, you know, you have to take action now to to you know to benefit from later. Even though you might as well close your eyes, talk away. I really don't want to talk about this, right? And complacent and move away because it's not affecting. Versus saying like, how do I show up? How do I show up for support? And what can I do? Absolutely. And I think, you know, again, as I was saying earlier, right, I mean, before I used to go out of my way not to engage in politics and social media, I mean, out of my way, because it's like, hey, it's unpleasant. I don't want to be unpleasant. Right. And unfortunately, you know, trend to trends point, you have to you have to deal with these, even though it might be unpleasant and hard and difficult. This is the time to deal with it. So that we can actually go beyond it to something where, you know, what, 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 what do people say about the promise of America, which is we are always working on that promise. This seems like this is one of those times where this is the time for all of us to face the hard truths, you know, and be open 
and be kind to each other and really listen and understand what people are going through instead of kind of, you know, ignoring it. So this is the time to do that. Um, so on that, on that note, um, can you talk about, you know, you know, I, I can talk a little bit about some of the things that, um, that I'm uh, talking with my teams and uh, that we said, hey, what, what can we do about this? You know, because, you know, as leaders, you know, you guys are coaches that coach leaders. This is a problem that, you know, leaders not only have to process for themselves, they also have to be part of helping their teams process it as well. So can you talk a little bit about what can leaders do at this point of time? What, what, what are you seeing? And what can we do to, you know, help the teams process this and then, uh, you know, go through the situation? Trent, why don't you go first? Yeah, so... Um, that was quick. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a real, it's, it's a challenging time, right? And this is where when people come to me and go, hey, I want to get in leadership, I'm like, careful what you wish for, right? Like, it's, it's a hard time to be a leader. And, and now with, with social media and all the good things of social media, there's a lot of bad things of social media too. So, you know, it's so hard when we see great promising positive stories and then we see like someone, you know, on the, on the dark, you know, social media side side arrange something very badly and no one knew about it. it's like so there's a lot of challenges in that as a leader you know one of the things that we have inside our organizations is is we should should have the benefit of of being that trusted leader and and person for our people to that we've set values and 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 things in place in our company about how we're going to treat one another, how we're going to treat each other, how we're going to act inside of that. And, and really good, strong companies have good, strong values that are administered and, and followed. You know, poor companies could have really good values, but if they're not followed, the, the values really don't mean much, right? And, and so from a leader standpoint right now, it is so important to come right down in crises, whether the pandemic, this challenge, it's a great time to bring everything back to our foundational values and how we're treating one another. And, and for me, this is where uh, we've lost. And this is what I would say one of the core conflicts of this racism, of this prejudice through the country, of, of through the lack of obedience to law and order in the country has been encircled around um, us having standards and maintaining those standards, not going gray on those standards and allowing a few people to, oh, well, they don't, they don't have to follow the values, but you know, everyone else should. And the, the standards of our work and our compliance, that's a big deal, right? When, when we're out of compliance in our companies, you know, you are fine. You are, hey, you, you, you're not following in the standard. We have HIPAA in the healthcare. There are standards. And, and some of our compliance and standards are held to the utmost. And then some are like this gray line that gets erased all the time and gets rewritten. And, and some of that, I think, has been, uh, you know, just evolved over the years. And I think it's become evident in, in certain levels of, of workplace and how this is happening. So, hey, how, how do we get 800,000 police officers in? And do we have four or 5,000 that haven't? They're not great employees. They're not, they're not high quality. Like we saw in this video, of not a high quality employee. Um, now in our lives, that's not life or death. Right, like that's 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 like, hey, you've messed up a a program and you're gonna be fired, right? Like, probably gonna have to let you go. But um, most of the time, nobody gets hurt or killed, for goodness sakes, right? But it is a it is a major challenge, and right now is a great time as we talk about as a leader the chance to have some conversation. Let's start with our values and how we want to be interacting together and treating one another, treating our clients, treating you know our vendors how we interact with one another. It's a great time to revisit. Do we need to change some things? Are we doing it the right way? And, and understand that the accountability and consequences for if you don't serve in those values, like you shouldn't be here. I, 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 like, I like the Zappos position where you come in and he says, hey, here's the values of our company and, and I've hired you and I'm, and I'm training you. 
And if you don't think you can follow these values in our companies, I'm going to give you $5,000 to leave and, and, and find your next opportunity because maybe this isn't the right place for you. Let's, let's eliminate people that aren't willing to, to meet that standard immediately. And, and that would be wise of most companies, but we know human is human, right? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to error. And, and there's going to be challenge in that. But um, I, I think that open discussion comes with trust from the leader. And I think this is the challenge right now in the political environment is that we don't, we don't trust our political leaders. 48% of us didn't vote for that leader, right? So we're like going, I don't even like this person. And I didn't like what they stood for before. Why would I trust them with decisions for me? So as we sit there and say, oh, well, we want political leadership. Does that really, does that really kind of exist in a short period? Because trust is built over time, right? And so if we don't know these people, we're not ready to make to give them access to our money decisions, life and death decisions, our health care. Like that's going to be a real challenge for any leader on the political front. So, so Trent, um, basically the two things that you're talking about really is this is the time for us to, to really focus on have the conversation, the open conversation with the team on our value system and is our value system, are we really First of all, is our value system the right value system to have? Yes. Right? And the second thing is that are we, are we just checking the boxes or are we really living those values? Right. Right? So those right. are the two things that you're talking about. And for that to happen, really you need to have like a trusted environment because otherwise people are not going to open up. For sure. Right? So, I, I believe that to be true. Amit, what, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? What do you... Sure. What do you yeah, so something, something Trent said earlier really, really struck a chord with me, which was like, even in times of extreme difficulty and bad stuff and bad things that are happening, there's good things that come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I did this exercise about a month ago where with a the, with the group of 40 people in leadership positions, and um, I asked them like, w w in this pandemic, we're all working from home, majority, 90% plus, like many of them were not essential workers, actually 100% if I were to be honest. And I asked them, well, in this pandemic, what new habits have you formed that didn't exist before that you would like to keep when you go back out back to work? And what I found was people people got better at cooking. People yeah. have been leaving uh, snacks for the UPS drivers and FedEx drivers right. that they never did before. Right? People have been exercising. People have that podcast that they wanted to start. They never had time for. They were able to do that. So, mm -hmm. and those, all those, and by the way, nature has returned in many ways. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's one thing. And now reflecting back, I mean, yeah, uh, am, I, am I happy with the political environment? No, I mean, you could probably guess my political affiliation just by looking at me, but you know, it's, it's, it is definitely a difficult, and we don't want people to be dividing us. The last thing we want is to be dividing us and instead of uniting together, because we are stronger together. So what, so there's three aspects to your question about what we're doing. I think that there's a three aspects from that point of view is what am I doing, right? What, are, what, what is the company doing? And what are we doing in the social fabric? So what I'm doing, I'm learning more about the history of my city and the black history of my city. And I can guarantee you, whichever city you're in, there's a book published or there's some articles or there's some newspaper which will tell you about the black history of your city. I am trying to educate myself. I'm trying to learn more about it. And I'm trying to learn this term anti-racism and what are the concrete actions I can do to do become that and teach my kids to become that. That's what I'm doing without waiting for the polit politicians to do something on my own. My company, I'm fortunate to work for a company that is taking this very seriously. So we have a partnership with a group called POSSE, P-O-S-S-E, -S -S -E, which, which has a leadership pipeline for people who are minorities, people of color, and I hate that term, people of color, you know, black people, Hispanic people, you know, Native Americans, anybody who have been marginalized and find out the emergent talent and give them the right access. Because it's not enough say, all right guys, I'm gonna hold your hand and now run because I already held them back. They're already at a disadvantage, even though I'm giving them equal access, doesn't mean bubkis because they can't do anything about it. So our company, we have partnership with Posse, we have, um, Asian resource groups, we have Hispanic resource, we have black resource groups, and we're partnering with them. And then we're also reaching out to people that we can mentor and teach in organizations. Like, you know, 
places that don't have access to the top-notch technologies, and we're going and bringing it to them. And then the third thing from a social fabric, you know that neighbor, you know that person comes into your environment, like you get, you get a little cautious, like what's going to happen next? We're trying to break those barriers. We're going to go and reach out and shake our hands. And we're going to, I mean, not shake our hands, stay. Shake, right? Distance, right? <laughs> but be yeah, respectful. Six yeah, six, I mean, and, and, and you know, my belief in science, I mean, it's probably not a solved problem. It's, there's a lot of gray area, but I would rather trust in empirical process rather than going with opinions and conspiracy theories. But reaching out to our community and going out and doing something more. So I think there's three flavors to it. And I'm seeing, I don't know if I'm making an impact honestly. But I think it's going in the right positive direction. And that's all is expected of us as leaders, because leadership is not easy. You know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, right? So, but this is, this has huge rewards, huge, huge rewards. Yeah. I, I, I have a, you know, I, I'm challenged by anti-racism, right? Because I, I, I find, I don't like that word at all. I find that there's prejudice across the board in all sorts of things. And, and skin color is just one of those prejudices, right? Like we, we prejudice over all sorts of things. And, and by the way, we all have them because we all grew up with a lens that said, hey, you know what, this is what that is. And we believe that to be true. And, and, and maybe that's not true at all, right? Like, so, you know, in leadership, we talk about the itties. We want integrity. We want diversity. We want accountability. We want responsibility. We want dependability. I want humanity. I think anti-racism is humanity. We have, we all believe the same. Like, listen, you can talk about all this stuff, but we are humans to the core. And, and you can look at it from the beginning of time to, to now, and it's never changed. People are made one way. They're built. They bleed. They bleed the same. We have functioning bodies that work 99.9% .9 the exact same. And there's just, what, outer exterior colors to it like changes of pigmentation like really like humanity is is, is where our, our challenge is in our heart right like how do we get back to understanding this is what humanity is and i'm wondering now like did we miss this in 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 our education programs in our school because this is a huge part of science to bridge all the gaps of how humanity actually operates physiologically and then humanity from a socialistic side. I'd Actually, love to that, see that. Very, I don't see very, it. Very interesting because, uh, you know, I think something what you said, Trent, and something what um, Emmett said earlier was, you know, I'm not sure if you have gone through this thing called uh, unconscious bias training. Mm. Uh, you know, you see, you see, so we, we, we went to, through this training in the last company that I worked in where, you know, a bunch of us are together and then they have this exercise where they, you know, call out specific characteristics. Like if you're an immigrant, step forward and then turn around and face everybody and then register what you think and register what you think other people are thinking. Yeah. If you had a father figure in your, in your family growing up, if you did not have one, come forward. If you came from a divorced household, come forward. You know, so when, and if you're, if you're in the military, if you had any military thing, if you had abuse, psychological conditions, you know? So all yeah. of these kind of things. And, and at the end of the exercise, what we got out of it was, I mean, you're right, Trent. I mean, there are prejudices and biases for all kinds of things, yep. but some are more than the others, yeah. you know? So, so some yeah. are definitely way more than the others. But the thing is that as human beings, we are, because of the way we are brought up, because of our parents, because of our friends, we have biases and prejudices. And even though intellectually we might know that, hey, there shouldn't be any, emotionally we still have them. And yep. a big part of it is really to understand that and accept it. As human beings, we think, how can we have prejudice or bias? I, 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 I don't see color. I see everybody the same. In reality, you don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, the minute you see somebody, you've already made an opinion of that person in yep. your mind just because of where you came from this yep. has nothing to do with the other person you yep. know it's because of you and the well, way you came from and your experiences yeah, right. you know, what, what's your experiences say yeah. personal experience with that right like uh and and that's i think that is is so, is right on Deepa. So I, I, I mean i think it is i yeah. 
Now, so I wanted to play a little bit with the, with the idea of it is, right? And prejudice, yeah, prejudice is, is a common problem, right? It's very common. And you know, if we want to have inclusivity, if you have positivity well, or like diversity, it. I like right? those cities. Yeah, those your prejudice is going to come in the way. That's right. For for your organization, for yourself, is going to come in the way. Without I've never, I've I've lived more than half of my life outside of my country of birth. I call America my home, but I've lived most of my life outside the country of my birth. I never lived in the same city more than seven years. I I had to constantly reinvent myself constantly. And I think we all should have a goal to grow because we're all stuck in our comfort zones. We're all stuck in our comfort zone, what we're comfortable with. And the, the really the power of our potential is to go outside of that, right? And for that, so prejudice, yeah, the, is, are the educational institutions working? I mean, in USA, we have a, we have a, we have a problem, right? With, with public education, we have a big problem there. So yes, there's let down, but now what can we do about it? And how can we break past? Because if we hang on to those prejudices too long, inclusivity is not going to happen. Diversity mm -hmm. is not going to happen. Positivity is not going to happen. So what we're going to see instead that. is, you know, it's like, I think it's like John F. Kennedy who said that, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if, if you actually go without it for too long, what you see is riots. And that, this is the result of this. This is a result of going for so long without it. And now it looks like people feel as if this is the only option. Mm. because all the other options did not pan up. Well, let's, let's point to an example of something that did take action. Let's look at like mental health in our country, right? Like mental health was viewed like when I was, I think a younger man or child even, mental health was like off limits. Like, oh, that person's crazy, lock them up, right? Now we've done tons of work into education and taking strides and science and medicine to understand this better. It's like, this is a human being Who's, who's physiologically challenged in their brain. They have a mental health condition. And we're starting to understand we've got a long way to go. Progress has been made. But I think there's been a different shift in lens of the mentally um, unstable, the mentally, you know, that are, that are injured Absolutely. and hurt in this. We have empathy now for that. We understand more than we ever did. Um, and, and I think it, it points to a sample of, of where, what, what's possible. Like, and, and is that all the way there yet? I, I don't think if I talk to people in a mental health, they say, Hey, we've, we've made it. We're, we're where we want to be. I'm sure they're on the journey, just like we're all on the journey to get better. Right. But I think there's areas to point to where we can do some actionable items. And this isn't something that's never been done before. We have paths to go and to get back to, what's right and, and, and how we carry ourselves and how we treat one another and, and our education levels. And it's, 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 to me, it's, it's, um, it, it always comes back. Like it, it's pretty simple. It's just not easy. Yeah. And, and I want to anchor on that because, you know, uh, people, you know, going to a therapist has a stigma, right? Sure. But now, you know, we have enough people say, well, we need to remove that stigma too, because sometimes you're locked, you know, that relationship with your parent, that relationship that you have, or some thing that is in the past that's coming in your way to unlock your potential. You know, that's therapists, right. psychotherapists can help you extremely, right? And there's, there's, there's benefit in that. But there's conversation far from over where we need to take it there. Now, what I'm heartened by is that in my children, I don't see the same prejudices that I have. And if my grandparents or my parents, I saw amplify prejudice. Mm -hmm. So as time goes by, the conversations are already shifting. Yes. Right? And so I am heartened by things that are already moving because they don't understand. Some of these conversations that happen from, from a place of prejudice, the kids don't understand because they can't connect to it. So I think it's shifting and it's shifting in the right direction too. We just need to be more in tune and make it actionable, like you said. You know, bring in science, bring in awareness, bring those conversations in. Well, I think and it's empathy, also like, right? I'm sorry, Diva, go I'm ahead. sorry. Empathy and listening, where again, create a trusting environment where you can have the conversations because you don't have the solutions, but if you can create an environment to have the conversations in a way that you're moving forward, that is what you can do without waiting for anybody else. 
Yeah, and I think I think the pandemic is a good place to look too. As as the epidemiologists have talked about science, as, as if you get to a level of where it's it's we overcome it by the herd theory. Like, hey, we eliminate this thing to a very small fraction. So if you did all this education, and, and let's let's stay with mental health. If mental health does all the education, we get this heard level where people ex- start accepting and start understanding are there, are there always going to be a couple of people going hey that person's crazy you need to lock them up that's what we should yeah you're going to have some one-offs that are just going to be like who who thinks like that <laughs> like have you ever read a book did you go to school like it, it's challenging that that we see someone who has a different lens but i i don't think that's ever going to stop just like it's not going to stop that people are going to be put in a position of employment that they're not good at. And, and guess who, by the way, do I own part of that? Because I've done that before. I've put someone in a position who probably doesn't have the skill set that they need in order to be successful in that role. They would really like to do that role, but I allowed it. I put them there and then they, and they failed horribly. It was a miserable experience for all of us. And finally they were fired. Don't I have a responsibility in that? Like I didn't, I didn't do what was, I didn't help them. I didn't help put them in a position. And so we have to consider like, this is where that you see things. Like if, 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 if let's say Derek Chauvin has got this history of experience of, of racial, you know, bias, and he's got who, who's responsible that they allowed him to keep going out. Because that's where we didn't draw a line in the sand. And, and, and I'll flip that on the other thing too, on, on Floyd. Because I don't want to see anyone die and everybody agrees with that. But he has continuously been a lifelong criminal and put himself in, in law and order's way. And, and that's not great either. He doesn't deserve what he got. That is 100% for sure. But we all know that there's prejudices and we all know there's value. And, and people have always made... I mean, how, when's the last time you had a conversation called guilt by association? <laughs> hey, you were with all these people and they were doing something badly. Well, I wasn't doing something badly. Well, it's guilt by association. Oh, I get it. So it, we, we, we've got to get back to this core value and conflict of how do we drive into humanity? How do we choose the right things and, and keep addressing how us doing the right things doesn't just serve us. It like serves everybody. Because when I do the wrong things, that ripple effect in, in someone in my position is really long. But any parent who chooses the wrong things has ripple effect right to their children so, directly. So, yeah, and uh, so I kind of have a little bit of a uh, disagreement and respect for disagreement. Sure. But I, I, want, to, I want to say that you know, the cause and effect needs to be looked at it a little bit more detail, right? So, you know, life of poverty, growing up in a house of drugs, growing up in, in, in Chicago, we had ghettos, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're already at a disadvantage and say, thank you. Yeah, well, you guys are like, you know, it's the condition, this conditions are already right for crimes to start. start yep, up. that's right. And I will take it if people are not randomly being killed and randomly stopped just because of the color of the skin, I will take that as its progress, as success, right? I will take that any particular day. So there's, and there's a little bit of, you know, how do we make police officers? You know, there was an article I was reading, 10 weeks of training and out you go, right? Mm. Whereas in Norway, which has, is like, you know, Norway has a very great example of how much application is expected. And, and there's a series of steps. They, it is, it's so hard to become a police officer in Norway because of the rigor and the, the amount of training and practice that goes into it before they could put you on the force. Whereas it is kind of like shortcut. And, you know, we have excellent police officers. We have amazing human beings and majority of them amazing, outstanding citizens, right? Outstanding people who are, you know, we love for them to, to serve and protect. Remember, serve and protect. Yeah, right. some, you know, some of the bad elements. So I, I don't say... But this is, as a society, I think this is, this is the smoking gun, right? When can we stop? Um, I'm part of software teams. There are AI software that predicts where crime will happen. And it's looking at that based on existing data. So neighborhood data, crime rates. And guess what? The software already has prejudice built into it. 
in mm-hmm. all the predictive because where do you think it's sending you where do you, where is it telling the cops to go in which Chicago, neighborhood into the right? ghetto and as a black person i'm walking in a, a privileged white neighborhood right and i'm not a black person but i feel for them right and i'm jogging you know when will somebody call up on me and say okay what is this person doing there if those conversations shift i think then we'll start seeing some progress so there's a little bit of gray area here and i respect that i love the pivot i love the idea of you know we have the strongest military in the world like you know i love the action item of can you be a police officer if you haven't served in the military because that assures a year to two years of training before we ever get quote unquote a a more specific even 10 weeks of how it's going to be to work localized here in this environment, which, which would actually upscale the training a ton because we don't need to do foundational work because you got that in the military, right? And so, I mean, I think there's a lot of solutions out there for yeah. this that are possible, but we need to start having those conversations, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think that is, the, that is my biggest takeaway because you know what? You know, there are smart people who can come up with a lot of solutions and I'm sure... I, I'm positive that a lot of people are, but with respect to just bringing the conversation back to in our lives, in our teams, what can we do? And I think the thing is that, again, having these, again, these conversations that we are having is a function of where have we been? Who are we? What is our background, right? And it is, it is you know, we're not going to all agree with each other. It's not going to be Kumbaya, everybody singing yeah, happy yeah. dances. And, but the fact is that, having the conversation, understanding each other's perspective is super important because that is, you know, so far, but what I see is people talking at each other and not with each other. And when you're talking at each other and you're soapboxes, all you're doing is talking, you're not listening. So that listening aspect of it, whether you like the answer or not is important. And the respect of, hey, inquire versus making up your mind and just going at it. I think that is the biggest thing that I think all of us can do as leaders within our teams. We will not agree with each other, but let us try to get back to our values. Let us try to have the conversations and let's try to make incremental progress because it is better than not doing it. And with the incremental progress without, you know, before we know it, we would have actually gotten big chunks of progress ahead of us because we obviously cannot boil the ocean in one shot. <laughs> right? It's good. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, Trent and Ahmed. Thank you for having wonderful me. Wonderful conversation. I appreciate this thank is you for awesome. Me. We should do this more often. <laughs> yes. See yes, ya. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.